Okay, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, my name is Toby Ogene. I'm the Soil Resource Specialist in Cooperative Extension uh, at UC Davis in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources. Um, I'm a pedologist by training. Uh, how many of you know what a pedologist is? Just out of curiosity. That's better than usual, maybe about 5%. Uh, pedologist um, studies the morphology of soils, the nature and properties of soils, uh, their geography, and the factors that form them. And um, so before I start, this give be the title of Water Quality Contaminant Transport from Soils to Surface Water uh, in Annual Rangelands. And I want to highlight uh, the people that are part of this team. Myself, Alex Swarovski, who's a uh, soil physicist in training, he's a graduate student. Uh, Randy Belvern, who's our biogeochemist. Peter Hernis, which is a, uh, he is a uh, organic geochemist. And Ken Tate, who's our, our hydrologist. So this team kind of uh, exemplifies the nature of this project. What we're trying to do, really, we're focusing on organic carbon, primarily from because of what Randy explained, that uh, when that material gets into the drinking water supply, it can become a carcinogenic byproduct. Also, this is what the funding agency uh, was emphasizing at the time. So, so we're certainly interested in organic carbon. And also, there's very little known about organic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, in oak woodlands. Um, so this team is, is kind of exemplifying uh, the nature of this work in that we want to know the source of DOC, dissolved organic carbon, in rangelands. We want to know how it's transported in the environment. We want to know its fate in the larger watershed component or capacity. And then we also ultimately want to know what best management practices we can implement to mitigate uh, organic carbon if it's a problem in our watersheds. Also considering other water quality contaminants to make sure that those um, are considered um, in addition. So I think I'll, for the most part, ignore this slide. Randy covered it pretty, pretty, pretty carefully. Oak woodlands are a large spatial extent in the state, and uh, a lot of the water that we drink passes through those ecosystems. That's why we want to learn more about them. So what I'm going to do is focus on four main experiments to help you uh, understand uh, our thought process through this project. First, we wanted to identify the sources of dissolved organic carbon by performing a leaching experiment, a field incubation of native plant materials to see what kind of dissolved organic carbon and how much they exuded. Secondly, we want to understand the hydrologic flow paths. What are the pathways through which water moves through soils and delivers water quality contaminants to streams. And then we wanted to find the fate. If dissolved organic carbon enters a, from a first order stream to a second order stream and then to a larger river, how, is there a similar capacity going on? And then finally, what kind of range management practices can we use, grazing intensities and such. So starting with this first experiment, what we did is we took plant residues, both litter and duff. Litter was essentially the material we collected that fell on the soil surface in the grass uh, that fall, fresh I guess, <coughs> litter. Duff represents the organic material that's sitting on the mineral soil surface that may be anywhere from one to 10 years of age and has various stages of decomposition. So those are the two plant residues or stages of decomposition we looked at, but we looked at four different plant materials. So we looked under blue oak canopy, uh, live oak canopy, foothill pine canopies, and then under open annual grasses. So those, so, so those were incubated in the field over the water season in triplicate um, for about 150 days. Rain fell on these little containers where our plant residues were, were out, and we collected the water that came through those plant residues after each rain event and analyzed them for dissolved organic carbon, dissolved organic nitrogen, and then our DBP, disinfection byproduct, precursors, and formation potentials. Uh, in addition to a lot of other just standard uh, water quality uh, constituents. So this is some of the, the data from that um, first experiment. On the y-axis of the upper graph, which is our litter, and the lower graph is our duck samples, you'll see uh, blue oak in the, in the triangles, um, live oak in the squares, grass in the diamonds, and then pine as the brown circles. Uh, Y-axis is cumulative dissolved organic carbon content, and then the uh, x-axis is time. And what you see first of all is that our blue oak plant residue leached the most dissolved organic carbon compared to other plant residues. 
But also an interesting fact that both Ken and Randy have been hinting to is what we see in these first couple of storm events. I'm not using a pointer because I can't remember where it is. Um, sorry. Uh, over 70% of the DOC yield was supplied in those first two storm events. Kind of focusing on our backing up this pulse uh, event type signature that we see in the streams. Looking at the duff on uh, the lower uh, corner, we'll see that we have, for, at least for the, the blue oak, much less dissolved organic carbon that was leached from the plant materials. Uh, in this case, grass had the most, and it was slightly higher than that of the litter. <coughs> so, looking at dissolved organic nitrogen, um, we see a, a, a slightly different story. In this case, um, both grass and blue oak had uh, the highest uh, dissolved organic nitrogen compared to other plant materials. Um, and again, after the first two storms, most of that material was leached out of, uh, or was supplied into the water uh, collection uh, system. But in this case, when we compare it to the duck, we see a, a much different story. In this case, the duck is supplying much more dissolved organic nitrogen compared to uh, dissolved organic carbon in the litter and duck comparison. So uh, both blue oak and annual grass supply more dissolved organic nitrogen in the form of duck than uh, fresh litter. So um, in terms of scaling up this experiment, you know, we looked at the formation potentials of all these individual uh, uh, leachates, um, but a lot, and there were differences in the, in the disinfection byproduct formation potentials. But when we scaled this up based on the canopy coverage of the different vegetation uh, uh, assemblages, their thicknesses of, of duff, um, we saw that blue oak and grass, because of the, the sheer acreage and coverage of these plant species, um, they, they, they took the story. And you can see that, um, for example, uh, on blue oak litter, 74 kilograms per hectare of DOC could potentially be produced from that, that kind of residue. Um, and in terms of THMs, 2.1 uh, kilograms per hectare could potentially be produced if we were to scale up to a 36 hectare, uh, well, if we were to scale up to a hectare um, level. And we use that uh, in a representative watershed that um, I'll, I'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, grass, also pretty high in terms of litter. 31 kilograms per hectare of DOC that could potentially be produced from these materials. Uh, almost one kilogram per hectare of THMs um, and 0.09 kilograms per hectare of HAMs. Duff was even greater because it's a thicker, it, it essentially represents organic material that's accumulated maybe for five to 10 years. Um, so we see that approximately 300 kilograms per hectare of DOC could be potentially yielded from blue oak duff um, in large amounts of THMs, um, and DON, and even HAMs. Uh, grass a little bit, quite a bit lower. Uh, the duff layer is a little bit thinner in those systems. Um, but we see about 24 kilograms per hectare of DOC being potentially generated from those. So those are our big players in these, these types of landscapes. But interestingly enough, uh, when we look at a hydrograph, now I, I showed you that figure where we, uh, we expose these materials to that uh, field uh, incubation. We actually measured flow from that uh, experimental watershed. Uh, this blue line represents the flow rate of that stream in the 2006-07 water year. Those gray dots <coughs> represent the dissolved organic carbon concentration. Uh, in those storm events, where they are sampled uh, with the rising wind, peak flow, falling wind, and base flow. And we see that pattern that, that Randy had alluded to, where we see pulses of dissolved organic carbon. This is it. So we see pulses of high concentrations of DOC in the first few storm events, particularly at peak flow, where our highest concentrations occur, but then they decrease over time. And we, you can see this is done in a relatively dry year, so we don't have many storm events during this time. But, uh, so we did see that trend, and interestingly enough, when we compare the total amount of DOC exported from this watershed, compare it to the total potential 
DOC that could be produced from these, these uh, plant materials, only 0.5% of the dissolved organic carbon is actually exported from the stream. Much of that is being essentially retained in the soils within the watershed, either by sorption of organic molecules to soil particles, or through microbial oxidation of the organic materials, photooxidation of the organic materials, um, or incomplete leaching. That's a potentially, uh, potential problem too, especially, or issue, especially in uh, these dry years. So this kind of leads us to our next experiment, where we wanted to try to figure out what are these transport mechanisms that communicate dissolved organic carbon from the litter materials into our streams. So <laughs> we're fortunate enough to have uh, been able to build this uh, experimental watershed uh, at the SFREC station. It's a 36 hectare watershed um, that uh, we have instrumented with uh, over 100 soil profile investigations. Within those soil profiles, we have placed soil moisture sensors that are recording volumetric water content every 15 minutes at four different horizons. So I think there's something like 500 sensors scattered all over this watershed. We have a high resolution digital elevation model in the watershed, a one meter digital elevation model that's helping us understand how topography routes water um, from the uplands to the stream. And that's only based on topography, not necessarily other factors. Um, and that's what this figure here is showing you, this high resolution digital elevation model. Um, but we're using uh, this infrastructure to understand um, how flow paths are operating in our soils and how they communicate that to streams. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So this is our conceptual model here. Uh, this is a typical soil profile here in the uh, uh, Sierra Oak Woodlands in the metavolcanic terrain. Um, what I'd like you to notice, first of all, is that many of these soils have what we're calling uh, uh, a clay pan. And this is an abrupt increase in clay content, maybe 20% over a very short distance, maybe two centimeters. And this clay pan is very slowly permeable to water. And so as water infiltrates, and these soils here in the metavolcanic terrain have exceptionally high infiltration rates because they are very well and strongly aggregated soils. So as they rapidly accommodate rainfall, and that water moves through the soil, it hits this slowly permeable zone. And because water is infiltrating and water is slowly moving down here, water perches and builds up. Now these layers, both what we're calling the A and the AB horizon, these are actually very permeable horizons. The clay content is modest and they're very well aggregated. So when we have perched, saturated conditions, it's kind of like imagining that little drain on your sink. If your sink's clogged, water rises, and then it hits that hole, and it dumps down. That's exactly what's happening here. Water rises, and as it hits these permeable layers, it is shed very rapidly, laterally, uh, with, the, with the slope. And so that's our kind of conceptual model of how the soils are, are functioning. And, and, and I mentioned that um, these soils have a very high water infiltration capacity. So we don't see a lot of infiltrate our surface runoff in the sense where uh, rainfall intensity is, is greater than infiltration capacity. But we do see runoff when the soils are completely saturated at the soil surface. Then there's no place for water to go. So it runs off the soil surface. So in extremely wet situations, we have surface runoff and a great deal of lateral flow. Now, we hypothesize also that these unpermeable layers may slowly supply water to streams as base flow. But because they're very impermeable, there's very little water being supplied. So to, within our experimental watershed, um, we're trying to quantify some of these other uh, flow paths. First of all, uh, we have a stream water, stream monitoring network that was set up by uh, Mike Singer, Ken Tate, and, and Randy Dahlgren, where at high flows, we use a partial flume, and at low flows, a uh, notch weir, and we have a water height sensor that is logging uh, water height continuously. So we have a record of stream flow for about 10 years at this experimental uh, watershed. And what I think is, is Awesome. 
is our trench. This, I call it the perched water monitoring infrastructure. And this is built by uh, these guys and the SFRX staff. And it has three soil profiles instrumented with these uh, trays that are inserted into the soil at these different depths, 10, 30, 65, and 110 centimeters. Our clay pan is, starts at about 65 centimeters. So this tray is right at the surface of that clay pan. And it collects the water coming off of these horizons, <coughs> excuse me, routes it down slope into these barrels. And ahead of these barrels are chicken buckets. So we can capture that water for water quality analysis, and we can also use these chicken buckets to calculate flow rate uh, in this uh, infrastructure. This is probably one of a handful of instrumented watersheds, I think, in the world that are instrumented at this level. So it's, it's a jewel uh, to work with. So just getting at some of the information that we can learn from this experimental watershed. Uh, up above, we have stream flow hydrograph. I think this is one of our bigger storms in May 2006. And below, we have the hydrograph from our perch water monitoring trench. Uh, in red and black are our two top layers, our A and AB horizons. These are our permeable layers. And then in green and blue are our subsoil layers. <coughs> This actually should be made, labeled as sea rising. Um, but it's more slowly permeable to water. Um, and what we see that is, that is interesting here is that uh, the onset of stream flow coincides exactly with the onset of perched water flow in the AB horizon. Uh, also, in the BT horizon, uh, those two are, are starting at the same uh, time. Uh, Another important factor to, to notice, the AB horizon is supplying most of the volume of water. Uh, and so it is really a culprit for stream flow generation. I would expect the A horizon to be a little bit higher in terms of volume of water supply. Uh, maybe. It's a little bit thinner horizon. It, it's 10 centimeters, whereas the AB horizon is 30 centimeters or, or 20 centimeters. Um, but uh, also, it could be that the water, the perched water table, only reached a very small portion of that A horizon. So in order for that A horizon to completely see its biggest potential, you have to have saturation all the way to the soil surface. Whereas that A, B horizon, in a good storm when the watershed's prime, that thing is always pumping water. And so um, you'll see that those, while those, the B, T, and C horizon um, are saturated for quite a bit of time, they're so slowly permeable to water that they don't give us a lot of, of stream flow. So uh, this is a figure showing you some of the results from our uh, volumetric water content sensor network. Okay, And again, uh, well, this is volumetric water content in the y-axis, time on the x-axis, our soil depths, our horizons, black and red are our top layers, um, and green, blue, and blue. Uh, our subsoil layers, our A B horizon, our permeable layer is the red layer. And <laughs> what, it, what this shows us is that it gives us an insight into the dynamics, how, how soils wet up, dry down, and how long they stay saturated. When you see these flat lines here, 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 and there, uh, at the big peak storm events. Those are episodes of complete saturation. And so saturation is a little lower for our, our topsoil layers. It's about 35%. And saturation is a little higher for our subsoil layers, almost 40%. And what we see uh, is that there are very sharp changes in saturation to, to drier states in our A and AB horizons. And that's because they're so permeable. As they wet up, they shoot water down the slope. So you would expect to see those sharp changes. In our, our, our less permeable layers, we see more constant, longer, wetter episodes. So what we're doing is we're trying to use these, this sensor array to understand a variety of questions. One is, uh, what is the spatial extent of saturation uh, across the watershed? And how does that result, or what, what are the implications in terms of stream flow? And how does that relate to the surface topography? Can we model flow just by topography, or do we have to consider soil stratigraphy? So this is a map from our sensor array uh, in the top 30 centimeters, looking at soil moisture content during the peak storm flow in 2008. Um, I don't remember the exact date. 
Uh, but this is when the, the watershed was at its wettest last year. And what you'll see here, the saturation is at about 38%. <coughs> so essentially most of our green colors represent saturation. And, <coughs> and therefore, that is showing the connectivity of the landscape in terms of lateral flow through the watershed to the stream. These blue lines here represent the model hydrologic flow paths from our digital elevation model. So it's taking into account the slope and the curvature of the watershed or the landform to see how water would be routed if it were just moving on the soil surface. So what we do see here, which I thought was kind of interesting, is some of the areas of saturation match the, flow, the model flow path quite well, whereas others are unsaturated and do not match uh, the model flow path. So um, we need to consider soil stratigraphy in terms of understanding uh, the connectivity of our landscape um, in terms of water flow. And when you look at this a little closer, we use those 100 cell profiles to develop a map of the clay pans that are scattered throughout our experimental watershed. This is a picture of it here. You can see this sharp change. That's the clay pan right there. Um, the blue colors represent uh, the distribution of our clay pan. The green colors represent the distribution of soils without clay pans. <coughs> and what you see is that this closely matches our saturation map. Um, and so what we're finding is that the connectivity of the clay pan uh, essentially routing lateral flow to the stream in specific areas. And so this has implications in terms of uh, calculating uh, the amount of the watershed that actually is leached. It also has implications in terms of the connectivity of flow paths and the connectivity of surface runoff. Because remember, surface runoff can only occur in these, for the most part, is mainly occurring in these landscapes where we have the soil is completely saturated. So when you have this, this pathway of complete saturation all the way to the stream, that might be a place where you might want to put a buffer strip in, in order to capture that. So now that we got some insight into how water is being routed, we wanted to learn uh, a little bit about the fate of dissolved organic carbon um, in these landscapes. And what we did here is we first studied um, the source watershed, our experimental watershed, during a representative storm in 2008. And we sampled water every hour from the onset of rain until it ended in a variety of the different hydrologic flow paths that we could imagine. We looked at rainfall, we looked at perched water in the different horizons, we looked at surface runoff, we looked at groundwater, stream water, of course, all within the experimental watershed. And then we looked at that same uh, the water in the in Dry Creek, which our watershed feeds, and then we look at it in the Yuba River below the confluence of Dry Creek, and then the Yuba River in Marysville, and also in Inglebright. So we wanted to see how dissolved organic carbon is attenuated as it moves from a first order watershed uh, down into the Yuba River, which is a potential drinking water supply. So this is a graph showing dissolved organic carbon um, in the various flow paths that we looked at. And you'll notice, first of all, that our big flow paths, gopher holes, surface runoff, ground walk, uh, sorry, A horizons and AB horizons, <coughs> these, are, these are areas that have the most dissolved organic carbon because they're in spots where organic carbon is, and that's in the, at the surface or in the top 30 centimeters of soil. So these are the, the flow paths where water is interacting with dissolved organic carbon and organic matter. Whereas groundwater, the BT horizon and C horizon, water has to move through the soil. It's being filtered, organic matter is being sorbed or attached to soil particles. So those flow paths are essentially being cleansed by the, the contact of water with carbon uh, onto soil particles. So this is a comparison of our, our main flow paths, A, B, B, T, and C horizon perched water um, with stream flow in the experimental watershed. And what you see here, this is base flow. This is, these three peaks represent our storm flow, essentially. But 
I'd argue this is probably storm flow too because uh, we really didn't have baseball. The stream channel was dry at the time. Um, and what we see here is that the dollar net carbon is, is relatively high from four to six uh, part per million, and that matches very closely with the A and A B horizons, um, and, and to a lesser extent the BT horizon. That be, remember the water that is above the water is actually above that clay pan. It's not in that clay pan, so there is a little bit of organic matter in that soil, uh, in that water. And so uh, clearly, uh, there's a relationship between water moving in these these uh, permeable layers, rich in organic matter, and uh, the, the the concentration of organic carbon in that water. So I don't want to spend much time on this, but I had to throw it in. Um, we're trying to <laughs> this is going to be tough. We, we're trying to definitively show that water from the A and AB, especially the AB horizon is the main water that's supplying source uh, storm flow in the streams. And what we did is we mapped um, the O18, the isotopic signature of oxygen, and the isotopic signature of hydrogen from water. And over that storm event, we developed uh, a line for the stream. And that's kind of what the stream water looked like during that storm event. And then these letters represent the isotopic signature of perched water um, during that storm event. And what we see is at the beginning of the storm, 11, 12, three, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, o'clock, um, first the signature didn't look like the stream. But over time, the AB horizon, which supplies most of that perched water to the stream, looks very similar to the signature of the stream. And over time, the water above the BT horizon begins to get closer to the signature of that, of that uh, stream water. So we're seeing pretty definitively here that indeed the water coming as perched water is feeding the streams and that's our major uh, supply and that's why the streams have a relatively high VOC concentration. So looking at this uh, uh, in terms of the entire watershed in the Uber River, what we see first of all in our experimental watershed, we have about four and a half um, part per million dissolved organic carbon, and it maintains that level in Dry Creek, which uh, our experimental watershed feeds. But then, as that hits the confluence of the Uber River, just below that confluence, it drops to uh, less than two, which is below the recommended guideline, uh, which is three. <coughs> and then again, uh, it stays relatively low in, in, in Marysville. So we're seeing uh, this attenuation that Randy talked about in his talk, where it could be that Inglebright is diluting that water to an extent that we won't see the signature. It could also be that we're seeing photooxidation of the organic material or even microbial decomposition of the organic material. But nevertheless, at the watershed scale, um, large watershed scale, uh, we're seeing that this, this, this material is attenuated. So moving on to the, the final study in, in this talk, we wanted to evaluate uh, rangeland best management practices that could be applied to decrease dissolved organic carbon uh, that's being emitted to streams, being mindful of other water quality constituents of concern. So we used our experimental watershed, which has had no grazing for 10 years, um, an adjacent watershed, uh, which we call Watershed 2, which has had moderate grazing for 10 years, and that's at a level of 1,000 pounds of residual dry matter per acre at target uh, moderate grazing rate. <coughs> we also have a watershed uh, that had moderate grazing um, and prescribed fire in 2002 and up oh, forth. Uh, and it turns out uh, that, that we're not seeing the impacts of that fire uh, when we monitored in 2008 and 2007. Uh, and then heavy grazing uh, at 500 pounds per acre of residual dry, dry matter as a target um, for that landscape. So these are paired watersheds, very similar um, in uh, vegetation, slope, a uh, little bit different in size, but not much. I think they range between uh, 100 and 300 uh, acres. 
So this first graph shows us um, the effects of rangeland management on organic carbon concentrations in streams. All these streams, we collected water uh, with auto samplers during storm events, and we have um, uh, flumes to measure, or yeah, flumes to measure and years to measure flow rate. And what we see here, we have VOC, dissolved organic carbon on the Y, and the treatment across here. The control uh, had was significantly higher uh, emitter of dissolved organic carbon than any other of the treatments. And that makes sense. We have no vegetation management going on. We're just letting biomass accumulate. It rots. It exudes um, this dissolved organic carbon that's transported to the stream. Looking at uh, nitrate nitrogen, uh, the impacts of rainforest management on nitrate uh, concentrations. First of all, that nitrate here on the y-axis, you should notice that we have very low overall concentrations of nitrate. Um, and uh, in the control, we have the lowest uh, concentration of nitrate in the stream water. Heavy grazing have the highest, significantly higher nitrate levels, low overall. Um, the best scenario in terms of managing for dissolved organic carbon and nitrate would be to choose the moderate grazing, either with or without fire, although I don't think the fire is really having an effect. Uh, the same situation with total suspended solids. Uh, in this issue, uh, we see that um, the heavy grazing treatment was significantly higher than the others, and actually was quite high, around 25, um, uh, I think that's grams. I got the wrong um, units here. It's grams per liter, not no per liter. Oh, it is no grams per liter? Um, so it's pretty high. Um, and, and quite variable in the heavily grazed system. And that's because, if you can imagine, there's a lot of exposed surface, um, and the timing of that exposure with rain events can, can result in a very heterogeneous delivery of sediment to the, to the water supply. So again, um, quite high TSS in the control. Um, moderate grazing is our solution, it looks like, for this. Uh, this is Ken's slide um, looking at uh, pathogen indicators uh, as a function of, of wetland or uh, watershed uh, uh, management. This is our control, our two moderate grazing, and this is our heavy grazing. And you can see here, uh, heavy grazing clearly uh, is a source of, uh, a pretty high source of uh, fecal fall form and E. coli. Uh, quite a bit lower in these treatments. You notice there is quite a bit of variability here. Um, and a difference in variation between moderate, the two moderate grazings and the control, uh, suggesting that there's no um, true zero uh, when you consider a control. There's, there, there, these indicators are out in nature, and it may have nothing to do with, with cattle, the presence of cattle. So in, in summary, we found that uh, most uh, DOC and DON is leached during those first couple storms. That's why we see those pulses both in our streams and, and, and in a statewide survey in the first couple of years. So this is actually good news because possibly we can develop strategies at the treatment plant to accommodate those pulses of water. It could be quite expensive, but at least we know a little bit about when these materials are coming down at their highest concentrations. Um, blue oak and annual grass litter have the highest potential production of THMs and HAAs and other uh, DBPs. And um, that's largely due to because their, their spatial extent in the watershed. Um, only 0.5% of the total production was exported by our stream, um, which suggests that uh, soils play an important role in sorting these compounds, keeping them in the soil so that they can be degraded by organisms. Although we studied this in a dry time, and we could have incomplete leaching, as that map of, of saturation showed, and the clay pan map showed, uh, maybe about 60% of the watershed is actually fully saturated and being drained to the streams. And so we may be getting incomplete leaching. Um, lateral flow is our main flow path. Uh, the connectivity of these streams is, is, is determined, or the connectivity of the flow path is determined by the distribution of the clay pan. Um, the OC was high in first and second order streams, but attenuated in the larger rivers. Um, DOC export was highest in the ungrazed uh, watershed um, due to the high amount of biomass. But in order to account for all water quality constituents, 
the best management practice really is, I guess, what I mean to say is, um, you could implement high grazing and limit the DOC production, but you have to account for other water quality constituents. So the best uh, grazing treatment would be a, a moderate um, grazing treatment um, to account for um, all water quality constituents. Um, but just real quickly, I wanted to uh, thank our funding uh, agency and all the people uh, that played a huge role. Johnny Dang, Donna Dutra, Tony Rosso, Dustin Favell, Martin Beaton. I don't know if I said your last name. Yeah, uh, uh, Jeannie Evett and the entire SFX crew. Uh, thanks, thanks so much.